welcome to Ascend Global Church and welcome to our meeting today. And uh, especially welcome to those who are all online. <laughs> we haven't got a meeting today that we can just gather together and be together and worship, but uh, we can reach out online. And so I'm so glad you've joined us online today, whether you're watching live or whether you're going to watch it a little bit later. Uh, the anointing of the Spirit of God is here to touch you. And our prayer today is that God really speak into your heart and speak into your life. And uh, I know you're going to just enjoy the message I have prepared, felt it in my heart from the Lord. So the message is called Resist the Spirit of Fear. Resist the Spirit of Fear. What on earth is going on in the world? My goodness. Look, when you look at the media and you look at the things that are coming out, and proclamations of this and that, and we have lockdown and then we're free, then there's more lockdowns. And uh, if you look into the news, you see... Uh, Struggles taking place in the global supply chain, uh, possible inflation. In fact, when you look at the news, you can't help but realize that there's turmoil going on everywhere. There's turmoil in the financial area, turmoil all over the world in the financial area. Uh, there's turmoil uh, in the area of health. Everywhere you look, you find COVID has reached into every corner of the earth. There's turmoil in, in the world. There's turmoil politically as there's struggles going on. And uh, we see in the political realm people uh, saying some things and then concealing other things and, uh, and using the opportunity to impose rules which we've never been subject before in our life. It's quite a confusing time. And in the midst of it, there's a struggle going on in the church as well. I believe, though, this is the church's greatest hour. This is a great hour. Why do I believe that? And why am I not fearful about what's happening right now? Because Jesus prophesied and spoke very clearly. In fact, the Bible has a lot to say about the days in which we live. And uh, Pastor David brought out a, a scripture from the Old Testament a while ago. If you uh, can't run with the footmen, how will you handle the horses? In other words, if you can't handle the little stuff, what will you do or how will you handle big things when they come? Let me just read for you from Matthew 24. Jesus has been speaking to his disciples. They've asked him a question. What shall be the signs of the destruction of the temple? What shall be the signs of the end of the age and your coming? And he answered them in several different ways. But he, he, let me read just out of Matthew 24, verse 6, 7, and 8. And you will hear. You will hear. In other words, there'll be people talking. There'll be media talking. You're going to be hearing, and the news you're going to be hearing are not going to be good news. You're going to be hearing bad news. News of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. And notice that we're going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, for all these things must come to pass. So in other words, wars and rumors of wars and all the kinds of things that are, are, are happening or reported of, he said, they must come to pass. Let's go on a little bit further. He said, but the end or the end of the age he's referring to, and the uh, period between this age and the, the coming age of the millennial kingdom. He said, uh, for, this, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines or lack of food. There will be pestilences or pandemics. Uh, there will be earthquakes in diverse places. So he's saying there's going to be unusual conditions right throughout the whole of the earth. And he describes those conditions. He says, you'll hear about it. So there will be talk everywhere about negative things coming upon the earth. And you notice then that every person will be part of that shaking. Every person. You can't hide. You can't go someplace and not be part of the, the shaking. There is a shaking going on. And we're going to talk about that a bit more and what the purpose of God's shaking is. Because when God uh, shakes things, there's always a purpose he has in mind. So, so every person is going to be a part of that end time shaking that's taking place. And uh, the Bible makes it very clear that each shaking that comes will be followed by one that's even greater than the one that was before it. And uh, we read this in a number of places in Scripture. So what we're experiencing now, notice what Jesus said. He said, this is just the beginning of sorrows. So all the things, he said, when you hear of these things, in other words, media all over the world will be reporting things which are very negative, uh, overwhelming people with feelings of anxiety, loss of control, fear about what's happening and how they'll get on. And this is what's going on right now. I believe out of the pit they've been launched multitudes of spirits of fear 
that are troubling people everywhere. You can feel it uh, when you listen to people speak. You can hear it in their voice. You can hear that, that feeling of fear that's gripped them, the uncertainty and the insecurity they're experiencing. And Jesus has some things to say about that. And uh, we want to go on to that. So notice he said then, you'll hear of these things. Uh, in verse uh, uh, 8, he says, all these things are just the beginning of sorrows. So he said, when you hear of all of these things, that kind of bad news that's going to spread through the earth, he said, they are the beginning, the commencement of sorrows. What does the word sorrows mean there? The word sorrows means birth pains. It means uh, the pains or travail to give birth. It means labor pains. Now, now think for a moment. Jesus uses the word labor pains of, of a woman giving birth to describe what the conditions would be like at the end of the age. And so when a woman is in labor, initially there's slight discomfort and there's quite a distance between those pains. And then as she gets nearer and nearer the birth, then she feels much greater pain and the, these, these pains come much closer together. They become more frequent until finally she's ready and ready to give birth and then birth takes place. So he's saying that at the end of the age, there'll be like series of events take place and they will be initially small in, in size and impact uh, and, uh, free, and distanced apart. And then gradually they will increase and increase and increase until finally the very thing that God is intending at the end of the age, his return and the shifting of the kingdoms of this earth to become the kingdom of our Lord, all of that will take place. It's not going to be without pain and upheaval. And so Jesus indicated or spoke clearly about that. So he, he revealed that there would be a great upheaval before his return. Now, this is spoken of in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. It is in many different places. Let me read uh, from the book of Haggai. Haggai is a minor prophet at the end of the Old Testament. Haggai is speaking and prophesying to those who are restoring the temple. And uh, so as he's prophesying, he's speaking to people engaged in the rebuilding of the house of God after it had been devastated. And yet, as he prophesies, he's prophesying also of the end times, the times of the end of this evil age and the transition to the beginning of the next age. And this is what he says. Uh, he's speaking on behalf of God, speaking the message of God, according to the word, Agai 2, verse 5 uh, through to verse 9. According to the word I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Now, this is the very thing that Jesus spoke of when he told the disciples, when you hear these things, do not be troubled. That word troubled means literally this. Let me find, get the definition of exactly what that word means. It means don't be troubled. It means to be anxious, to be fearful, to be in turmoil. So he's saying, when unpredictable, uncontrollable events come on the earth, don't yield to the spirit of fear. Don't be troubled. Don't be anxious. Don't let fear govern your life, govern your relationships, govern the way you do life. You must resist fear. He said, for I am with you. It's the presence of God with us. It's the tangible presence of God with us and understanding what he's doing and what he's saying for us to do brings confidence and security in these, in these difficult times. So he revealed then in Haggai 2, he says uh, in verse um, 6, uh, <clears throat> Thus says the Lord of hosts, One more, once more, it's a little while, I will shake the heaven and the earth, the sea and the dry land. So God says he's going to shake the heavens and he's going to shake the earth. And he says, now he goes further. He says, now this is obviously something that's not happened yet. I will shake all nations. So in the Old Testament, through the prophet Haggai, he's prophesying that he will shake nations. In other words, the nations will be at ease, at rest, going about doing what they normally do. And then there will be things happen that will cause a shaking in every nation, a shaking in their finances, a shaking in their political scene, a shaking in their health, a shaking in every aspect of the society. He said, I will shake all nations. And then it says, this is what will happen. So this tells us when this is going to happen. He said, then the desire of all nations will come. This is referring to Jesus. Jesus is the desire of all nations, and he will come. How about that? He said, 
He said he will come. The, the desire of, they will come to the desire of all nations. And it's, it's obviously referring to him. He said, and I, I will fill this temple with glory. So he's saying that there's going to be a season of trouble, of turmoil, of upheaval prior to his coming. And then at his coming, it said that he will be the desire of all nations. He'll be the only one who's the Prince of Peace, can bring peace and into the world and bring settlement to the situation. And he says it will come with a strong, powerful manifestation of his glory. In another part in the, in the Bible, it tells us the whole earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Well, that's something we need to talk about another time, what that will look like and what that millennial thousand years could look like. It's really interesting when you start to study it and find out about it. But that's not where we can go today. So he says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, saying that finances lie in his hand, either to give or to withhold them. So in the end times, when we're going through these difficult times, there's a need to bring our finances into divine alignment and look to him as our source, because jobs and other sources of income will go through turmoil. And he says, and the glory of this latter house or temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace. Now, I can't spend a lot of time developing that, but let me just share a couple of thoughts on it. He's saying that in the end time, there will be a greater glory in the earth than there was in the days when the glory filled the temple of Solomon. I encourage you to read in the Old Testament, have a look at that season in Israel's history when the glory of God filled the temple and when the nation became the center of the nations of the earth and leaders of all nations came there to Israel to hear the wisdom of Solomon. It tells us there was great peace at that time, there was great prosperity, all prefigure the coming millennial reign of Christ on the earth. And so he tells us very clearly in that prophetic word, there will be a shaking of the earth. So what is the shaking about? The shaking is the preparation for the return of the king. The shaking is the upheaving of everything. And we'll see why it is and what God has in mind. And the Bible tells us that Jesus will come, he will return, and he will rule the earth as its rightful king. Let me just give you an example of that in Zechariah 14 verse 9. Zechariah was also a minor prophet, prophesying of the, uh, into his generation, but also prophesying into the end times. And he said, and the Lord, the Lord shall be king over all of the earth. In other words, he will be an emperor. He will be the king of kings. He will be the ruler over every nation in the earth. You just think of the nations of the earth. You put a name on those nations right now, and there'll be someone who will rule over them. Now, a lot of Christians... And a lot of people get caught up in all kinds of speculation about the end time and the, the mark of the beast and the antichrist and the one world government. Listen, this is the one world government that's going to be established. This is the one that will last. It's notice here, Jesus is the rightful king and he shall be Lord over all the earth. And in that day, it shall be the Lord is one and his name is one. So how about that? The Bible is very clear there will come a day when Jesus will be Lord over all of the earth, there will be a period of a thousand years when he and the saints who have raised to walk with him, saints who have been faithful in this current evil age, will work with him to renovate and restore the earth, to prepare it for the coming of the Father. Look what it says in Zechariah 14, verse 16 and 17. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of the nation. So there'll be a massive turmoil. There'll be all kinds of manifestations of the judgment of God. And it said, everyone who's left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem. So there's a prophetic insight there that in the end times, Jerusalem will be surrounded by its enemies. Nations will come against Israel and uh, the Lord will defeat them. And it says those who are left of those nations, indicating they have suffered massive losses and massive defeat, said they shall go from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now there's a lot in there. Notice what it's saying. It's saying that upon the return of the Lord, it said there will come a season in history when all nations, the leaders of nations, shall come up to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. How about that? And not only that, they will come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. What is the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, the Feast of Tabernacles is one of three major feast days in the Bible. 
When we look at the history of Israel, God ordained three seasons of celebration. The first was Passover, where they celebrated the freedom of the people of God from Egypt. Passover was a prophetic feast. It prophesied of the coming of a savior who would save us from sin. So the feast of Passover is equivalent to the death of Christ on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, giving us freedom from sin. The second feast was the Feast of First Fruits or the Feast of Pentecost, which came at the beginning of the harvest. They would bring a sheaf of first fruits. And so there was the early rain would come and there would be fruit come and they would come and present it to the Lord. Now, the Feast of Pentecost also is a prophetic feast. It prophesied of the day when the Spirit of God would be first outpoured, which happened and was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. So that brings us to the third feast. The third feast is also a prophetic feast made up of three parts. And this prophetic feast is prophetic of the return of the Lord and the great end time harvest. The return of the Lord and the great end time harvest. That feast has not yet taken place. It's not been fulfilled. But notice what the Bible says. It'll not only be fulfilled, it will continue to be fulfilled. It doesn't say anything about them continuing to celebrate Passover and Pentecost, but the Feast of Tabernacles, it said that every nation or the nations uh, that came against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it says this also, that it shall be that whatever families or nations of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, on him there will be no rain. In fact, that nation will have great difficulties. So notice he's talking now at a, of a coming upheaval and transition of the governments of the earth at the coming of the Lord. And he says, after that, nations will go up to worship the Lord in Jerusalem. I encourage you to look at what happened under Solomon. You'll get a little glimpse of it there, of the glory of it. And said, the nation that will not go up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, that nation will suffer a drought like it did in the days of Elijah. And so it's very clearly prophetic that there will be massive transition in the earth. Now, as believers, that's what we're to have set our heart on. The kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdoms of the Lord and his Christ. We need to have a vision of the end times where we see the coming of the Lord and the transformation of the earth and the erasing of uh, the sons of God to share with Christ in the governance of the newly uh, created earth. So don't focus all on conspiracies. Don't focus on conspiracies. Don't focus on all the corruption. Don't focus on all the confusion. Don't focus on all the conflicting stories about this and that and COVID's this and COVID's not that and the vaccine's this and the vaccine. Don't get caught up in all of that. When you get caught up in all of that, you're caught up speculating because you don't really know the truth. You're speculating. You're, you're taking, uh, 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 holding, taking hold of something that we can't be really sure of because there's so much confusion going on. And so one of the things we need to do that Jesus said, do not be troubled. Don't be frightened, don't be disturbed, don't be alarmed. Jesus must be given the first and central place in our life. So that brings us there. well, what is the purpose of the global shaking? God never does anything without a purpose. So uh, he doesn't necessarily create negative situations. In fact, the Bible says the opposite, every good and perfect gift comes from above. But God does use the, 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 uh, the situations that happen on the earth to advance or bring into the light his eternal purpose. So our key, our major responsibility, is to work with the Lord in relationship with him, hearing him, so you know what to do. This is your time to build your prayer life. This is the time to build your relationship with the Lord. This is the time for you to be hearing God, not spending all that time on media, scrolling around, trying to find what this one says and that one says. Why don't you let God speak to you? Why don't you build a relationship that will cause you to stand in the time of the storm instead of being blown away? Look what it tells us in Hebrews chapter 12. It almost repeats some of the prophecy of Haggai. Here it is here. And in verse 25 through to verse 29, he says, Now see, you don't refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape, he refused him who spoke on earth. How much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven? whose voice then shook the earth. So now he's promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but the heaven. Now, let's just stop there for a moment. 
Here's what he's saying. He's referring back to the time when the glory of the Lord came down on the mountain, Exodus chapter 19, and it says, the whole earth shook and the people trembled and they were afraid to go near the presence of God. The myriad of angels, the cloud of glory, the cloud of fire, it says God shook the earth at that time. And now it says he's not going to shake the earth only, he's going to shake even the heavens, the spirit realm. And he says, now this yet once more indicates the removal of things that are shaken as of things that are made, so that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. So that now we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace or hold grace, whereby we may observe God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. So within that passage, it tells us the purposes of God shaking. Let me give them for you. It's Hebrews 12, 25 through to 29. Number one, the first purpose of the shaking is to call the church to repentance. When there's a shaking in the earth, God is calling us to repentance. You know, the shaking in the earth precedes the coming of God's kingdom and power. Always the message of the kingdom of God was preceded by the call to repentance. Repentance is a change in mind. It's saying something like, I got it wrong. I did it my way. I now need to do it God's way. I need to turn in my heart and my mind in a different direction to the one I've been taking. The second is it's a call for prayer and revival. It's a call for prayer and revival. When things shake, it's a time to seek God. Rather than live in fear and insecurity, it's a time to come near to God and cry out to God. Because when things shake, people's foundation, people, the things they were secure in, get shaken, then fear and anxiety comes in as they realize actually they've trusted their security in things that are not stable. Notice what it said, the things which cannot be shaken may remain. So another purpose then for the shaking is to expose and uncover things that are ungodly that don't come from God. So in God's shakings, there's an uncovering of the things we've put our trust in, the idols of our heart, the things where we've found our security and life in, they shake. And when they shake, you feel insecure and fearful, don't know what to do. So one of the purposes of the shaking is to uncover our trust and hope is in the wrong place. Another one is for the, the, to remove them. It's to actually remove them. Uh, the, it says there, the shaking, the removing of things which, cannot, which can be shaken. So if things in your life can be shaken, if the things you've trusted in can be shaken, they can be stirred up or turned over or turned around and no longer relied upon, then that's the time to abandon them. That's the time to let them go. So one of the purposes of the shaking is to remove the things that can be shaken, things that are unstable, things we put our hope in and our trust in that are not reliable and stable. Too many people put their trust in things that are not reliable. And when that person or that thing that you trusted in proves to be not reliable, is uncovered to be not reliable, your world goes into shock. And so God says, I'm going to uncover it. I'm going to uncover it. There's going to be massive uncovering in this end time of all kinds of things that have been hidden and concealed. I think if you were to read and look at, through the media, you would no doubt see the kinds of corruption that's going on in governments all over the world. You, you can tell that what's being said and what's being done in many instances are quite different. And that, that, that all of that will come out. All of that will be uncovered. God will not let these things remain. He's going to uncover them and shake them all up. And uh, then the next thing is to prepare us for end times. The next purpose is to prepare us for end times. We're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So in other words, the whole purpose of it is to turn us to the kingdom of God, turn us to Jesus Christ, turn us to the one who is unchangeable. He says, I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. He is unchangeable. Nothing you can do can change him. He is unchangeable. And he's the unchangeable savior. He's the unchangeable deliverer. He's the unchangeable healer. He's the unchangeable son of God. And so we need to rest our life and hold on to things that are unchangeable. Because when everything else gets shaken, at the core of our being, we're a solid rock because we're holding on to the one who cannot be changed. Now, 
Notice there that uh, we're going to look at a scripture now that fear is actually a demonic spirit. So we saw that when God is going to bring about a shaking, that everything will be shaken that can be shaken. The shaking will come in waves. There's first one wave and then another. I don't think we're getting back to normal at all. I think that the world is in a process of change and shift. And it won't go back to what you used to and what you thought it was and what you liked it to be. It's in constant change. And just when they think they've got some answer to the, the COVID, then they find there's another strain and then there's something else and something else. If you've got your eyes open, you can see it's not going to become like it was. There's going to have to be massive change and we need to lean into God for that. And one of the big problems there is the, the, the challenge of fear, of overcoming fear. We saw there in that last scripture in Hebrews chapter 12, we're receiving a kingdom which can't be shaken. The things of God can't be shaken. They can be tested but not shaking. Therefore, let us have grace whereby we may serve God. So the, the purpose of, of, of shaking is to bring us back to that place of prayer, preparation, putting our first priority on the Lord and starting to engage in a greater level of serving God. So shakings should not draw us back from serving God. Shakings, one of their purpose is to bring to a greater passion to serve God. Now, know what he says here in 2 Timothy 1. Uh, fear is a demonic spirit. Fear is a spirit that is going to be unleashed in greater measure in the end times. All through the Bible, we see people being afraid and God speaking to them. Don't be afraid. I am with you. Fear is is a spirit. God is a spirit that's much more powerful than any one of your fears. Let's read in 2 Timothy 1, verse 6 and 7. I remind you, Timothy, Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, young disciple, young son in the Lord, stir up the gift of God that's in you by the laying on of my hands, for God has not given to us a spirit of fear. He's not given us a spirit of fear. He's not given us a spirit of fear. So notice then that fear is a spirit. The media focuses on the things that are negative. The result, if you feed on it excessively, is that fear and anxiety rise in your life. It's like an addiction. People seem to be addicted to things that make them afraid. That's why horror movies sell so well. People seem to want the experience of being afraid. I don't know what that is. It's a bit, bit weird, really. But uh, so notice there that believers can be overcome by fear and anxiety. And so the Bible talks to us about that. Fear does not originate from God. God is not the author of fear. God is the author of comfort and strength. God is the author of comfort and strength and ability to prevail. He says fear is a spirit. Fear is a demonic spirit. It's an invisible spirit being that affects the way you think. It affects your emotions. And if you yield to its thoughts, yield to the feelings of it, you find your life will be dominated by fear that will affect your choices, decisions. You will do all that you can to protect yourself from further hurt. It's exactly the opposite to moving by faith and living by faith. So what happens when you yield to the spirit of fear? What happens when you focus on all the things that are going wrong, the reports in the, in the papers of, of this one got this symptom, this one got that symptom, this is what happened when someone dies of COVID, uh, this is what happens when you take the vaccines, all of these kind of conflicting reports with elements of truth in them. If you focus on them and feed on them too much, what you're going to find is you're going to be overcome by a spirit of fear. Now, in the book of uh, 1 Kings, chapter 19 and the first six verses, it gives a sequence of steps when fear comes upon a person, how they respond. As I list those steps, perhaps you should have a think. Am I doing these things? Here's the first thing, loss of perspective. Loss of perspective. We can't see what God is doing. We're preoccupied with the negative and the possibilities of negative things happening in our life. Faith is exactly the opposite. It's believing and expecting and anticipating the good things of God. Secondly, there's the loss of faith. So when we're exposed to the spirit of fear and we yield to fear, then faith is lost and we begin to resist doing what he says to do. We begin to resist his commandments. Here's another thing. Fear, when fear comes around our life, 
Then there's also withdrawal from our God-given assignment in serving others. Elijah drew back from the assignment, the very reason God had raised him up and positioned him in the nation in that day, in that time, in that hour, and he drew back from his assignment, drew back from serving people at the very point they needed the man of God at that time. So when fear comes around our life, instead of reaching out to help and to serve and to minister, we draw back from the call of God to serve and to help others. Uh, third, the next thing is, the fourth thing is, we tend to focus on ourselves. We tend to focus on ourselves and on self-preservation. It becomes now no longer thinking about others, our attentions around ourselves, and how does this affect me, and how can I control people and relationships and events so I don't get hurt any further. Uh, it leads to, if you follow the story of Elijah, it leads to isolation, isolation and separation from meaningful relationships. Well, that's happening right now. Uh, after we were in COVID last year, there were some people when the COVID lockdown uh, uh, ended, they just remained at home. They refused to come out and mingle and mix. That is literally just fear. It's causing you to isolate from meaningful relationships. We need relationships. We're meant to fellowship. We're, we're called not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. God commands us to gather. We can't do life on our own. And of course, uh, you don't notice too much of it, but if you have eyes to look out there, you'll see the, the amazing increase of mental health problems and suicides during the season where people are socially isolated. If we follow Elijah's story, we find the next thing was heaviness. Uh, great heaviness and despondency and quite, he was quite negative about life. We're not called to be like that. We're called to be filled with the joy of the Lord. That's evidence of the kingdom, joy the Holy Ghost gives. He become, we become spiritually dry. We become spiritually dry and need a revival and a fresh encounter of the Lord. So if some of you have been overcome by fear, you'll be spiritually dry. You need reviving. You need the Holy Ghost to come upon your life again. And of course, the next, the last thing is that we develop a new normal, a way of living life that's self-protective and is actually abnormal. It's not the life God intended for us. How about that? That's what fear will do to you. Not to mention that it causes sickness as well. So notice what it says. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Spirit of fear is a demon spirit. It's a wicked, evil spirit. But God has given us his spirit. We are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And notice what he said. God has not given us the spirit of fear. It didn't come from him. Come from somewhere else. Come from hell itself. But notice God, God has given us. God has given. God has provided for us. What has he provided? God has given us a spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. And then he gives three characteristics. The Holy Spirit. The spirit. God has given us the spirit of power. God has given us the spirit of love. God has given us the spirit of a sound mind. Let's have a look at each of those. That's what God has given us. That's what God wants you to have, not a spirit of fear. God never intended you to have fear. You're not made to live with fear. You malfunction with fear. Malfunction with anxiety. Okay, so God has given us the spirit of power. That word power is the word dunamis. It's used always to describe the supernatural ability, the ability of God that comes from the realm of the spirit that enables men and women to do unusual things, to overcome unusual challenges. Listen, some of the needs that people have can only be met by the supernatural power of God. God makes available to his children the spirit of power. God wants you to be filled with the Holy Ghost and access supernatural resources that will minister not only to your own needs, but to the needs of others. He's given us the spirit of love. What does that word love mean? That word love refers, or the, it, it's a sacrificial serving love. It's a, it's a word that, the word love, it frees us from fear and empowers us to serve others. So whenever fear is present, love is missing. Wherever love is present, fear is missing. So the spirit of love is the very presence of God loving us and so impacting our innermost being that there's a desire to be generous and overflow to others. Many of us need an encounter with the Spirit of God, with the love of our Father, our Heavenly Father. Without that encounter with His love, there's a loneliness and emptiness in our life. 
in Paul in Ephesians 3, 16 and 17, pray that we would be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's the supernatural dynamic. And that we'll be rooted and grounded in love. How about that? So God wants you to be rooted in his love, to encounter his love, to experience his love, because that love will activate your faith. That love will activate your ability to trust God. He wants you to encounter that love. That love will cause you to look outward to serve others out of the overflow of what God's given you. Notice the third thing he said, I've given you a spirit of a sound mind. A sound mind. What does that mean, sound mind? That word sound mind means to restore you back to your senses. So if you're a bit disoriented, a bit confused, a bit out of focus, a sound mind means to be restored back to your senses. It also means to be restored back or to hold on to your duties. It means to encourage. So notice there that the spirit of a sound mind means that the Holy Ghost will work on you to, move, to encourage you and move you back to fulfill your responsibilities. If you are walking in the spirit, you'll be embracing your God-given responsibilities, not withdrawing from them and hiding in a cave. So we need the Holy Ghost to help us and we need to cooperate in that process of renewing our mind. We meditate in the Word of God. As we meditate in the Word of God, the Holy Spirit shifts and transforms our thinking and attitude and empowers us to be able to overcome. So it's no one can do this for you. Your heart must become established. Let me read for you a great scripture out of the Psalms, Psalm 112, 7 and 8. He's talking about a man of God, a man walking with God, and it says, He will not be afraid of evil tidings. He'll not be afraid of bad news. He'll not be afraid of the commentaries on the news. He'll not be afraid of what's on Facebook. He'll not be afraid of what's on the internet. He's going to be afraid of people telling him bad stuff. Did you hear the bad things that have happened? He's not going to be afraid. Evil tidings have a way of gripping our heart with fear. He says he'll not be afraid of evil tidings. Why? Because his heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Why or how do we overcome evil tidings? having a heart that's steadfast and trusting the Lord. And so you notice there then we need that. Steadfast means to be firmly established, securely determined. To be established means we lean upon the Lord and we're holding on to the Lord. So we have to cultivate a trust in God. So you notice he said, Timothy, stir up the gift of God that's in you by the laying on of my hands. Timothy had received a spiritual gift he had received a special empowerment by the Holy Ghost. And that empowerment was to enable him to minister to the needs of people. But that gift had become dormant. When we say dormant, it means it's there and present, but it's completely inactive. So why do the gifts God gives people become dormant? Well, there are many reasons. I'll give you two of them. This is one here. The first one there is fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Timothy was functioning in a gift. He was serving people. He was ministering to people. God was flowing through him. God was working through him. And now he's withdrawn. He's become quenched in his operations, overwhelmed by fear of people and circumstances and so on. And he's now no longer functioning in the gift. The gift is there, but fear has stopped it operating. The second instruction, the first letter of uh, Paul to Timothy, he told him in 1 Timothy 4.15, Timothy, do not neglect the gift of God that's in you by the laying on of my hands. So neglect is the second reason the gift stopped functioning. What does that mean? Neglect means to lack value of something, to, to, to not care about it, to, uh, to, to actually lack uh, investment in it. And so one of the reasons that the gift stopped functioning in our life is a fear. Another reason is neglect. We're not investing in the development of our life with God, the development of the gift. We're not investing. We're holding it all lightly. And sometimes people hold it lightly because they have a low esteem. They have a, a very wrong uh, image of themselves. They don't see themselves as God sees them, that you are sent by God to bring blessing to someone who's never heard about Jesus Christ. Man, this is an important assignment you have. So the gifts, gifts aren't for you. God gives you a gift for others. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Now, the manifestations of the Spirit are given to everyone or to each one and the purpose to profit others. So notice what we see there. You're a child of the living God. Every son of God, the word son means 
to build the Father's house. So God intends for every believer not to be self-centered and needy. That's not his plan for you. He not wants you to have a lifestyle where it's all about me and getting my needs met. That's so immature. That's like a little baby. God is wanting you to grow up and become a builder, a builder of other people. And so for that reason, he gives every believer's giftings. The gifting is given to you, but it's for others. God gives gifts to you for others. You're responsible to develop the gift, cultivate the gift, guard the gift, and to function in your gift, whatever it is. For some of you, it might be hospitality. Some of you might be giving. Some of you might be faith. Some of you might be mercy. Some of you might be leadership. There are all kinds of gifts. There's even the gifting, supernatural operations of the Spirit, prophecy, words of knowledge, healing, deliverance, all these things. God gives to us gifts. Not so it can establish us. The gifts are given to serve the needs of others. And so we need to have a strong faith in our life in these last times. Let me just show you then the last thing that we need to talk about is how can we get stirred up again? How we can get the gifts going in? How can we get flowing again? If you've let fear come over your life and you're now withdrawn, you've started to draw back from serving, Church attendance has gone down. Connection with people has gone down. Let me ask you this. How's it going for you? It won't be going well. Gradually, little by little, the blessing, the life, the flow, the power of God will lift off your life. It'll be uphill. It'll be hard. The Bible tells us that when we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything is added to us. God gives you giftings because he calls you to serve others and help them. You can't do that unless you engage with people. You can't, you can't minister to people the gifts you have unless you're willing to connect with them and engage them. So if you're drawing back, isolating, disengaging, you're going backwards, not forwards. You're yielding to another spirit. The Spirit of God will yield you forward. Get up, get praying, get going, get moving. Reach out to people, look for needs, look for opportunities. Reach out and stretch out, initiate connections. Start to serve people with what you have. So here's a few things you could do. Number one is repentance. We need to repent from drawing back in fear and we need to repent from neglect. If you're neglecting your gifts, not stirring your gifts up, not functioning in your gifts, if you've let fear get over your life and your life has become disconnected, disengaged, you need to repent. Repentance is turning back to God and his original design. Secondly, there's a need to build a strong prayer life. You need to start to build stronger in prayer. What has served you in the past won't serve you with the coming needs that are ahead. Develop and cultivate a very strong prayer life. Meditate on the Word of God. Let, let the Word of God get around your mind and heart. Begin to see yourself being used of God. Begin to picture God working through you. Start to see what God designed. Imagine it. God designed you to be a blessing to people. Start to see yourself being a blessing for people, praying over the gift you have, praying for the opportunities. Here's another thing. Listen to testimonies and miracles. Listen to people's testimonies, how God has worked through them. What it'll do, it'll encourage your faith. It'll lift your spirit. It'll, it'll stir fire. Notice what it says, Timothy, stir up the gift of God. That means it must be possible to re-enkindle, to let the fire and the passion come back again. And it's your responsibility to do that, to stir the gift up. These things are what helps stir it up. Repentance, a strong prayer life, meditating on the word of God. Filling yourself up or getting listening to testimonies of God moving in different places. Because no matter how much negative the news there is, behind it, there are things that God is doing the news isn't reporting. I've seen some of them. My, open up public miracles, miracle meetings, deliverance meetings, God moving and touching people in public, His glory coming upon them. This is a great day, a great hour. And of course then, the last is, you've got to take some risks. You just have to take some risks of faith. You've got to step out. Look for the opportunities to engage people rather than disengage. Don't put your mask off on and draw away. Rather, reach out to the person, connect with them, communicate with them. There's someone in need that needs the gift you have. I want to just pray for you right now that you will be activated again in those gifts of God. So I want you to just reach your hand out to the Lord wherever you are right now. 
God has a call on your life. God understands that life is uncertain and pressures have come, but he wants you to break your agreement with fear, to repent of that fear and to repent of the neglect of stirring and building your life to serve him. Would you do that right now? I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. I'm going to pray for the fire of the Holy Spirit to come upon you and activate and stir you back up again. Father in heaven, I thank you now for each person that's watching online right now. Father, I stand as their representative. And Father, I come before you and I declare, Lord, that we have surrendered to fear. We've surrendered to fear. We've surrendered to anxiety. We've surrendered to the spirit of fear. Lord, today we repent. We bring this to the cross and ask your forgiveness for not being the people of faith. For without faith, it's impossible to please you. We, Lord, thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing from all the defilement of the spirit of fear. We break agreement with the spirit of fear. We say and declare God has not given us a spirit of fear. God has given us a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. Today, we unite with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for releasing the spirit of power. Thank you for releasing fresh love and revelation of your love. Thank you, Lord, for releasing clarity and sharpness of thinking about the call and purpose of God, of thinking about serving. Lord, today I stand alongside and with all of those who are watching that have neglected their personal life with you, neglected or despised the gift that you have given them, made small of it and negated it, compared it with others in whatever way that we have dishonored the gift you entrusted to us to be used by us to serve you, to build your church, to extend your kingdom. Lord, we repent of that right now, of that neglect. Lord, today we receive by faith a spirit of prayer. We receive fresh fire right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for the release of the Holy Ghost. I write, thank you for release of an, of an anointing upon people right now. We just call that anointing to be activated. Three, two, one. The power of God is upon you right now. I call your gifts to function again. I command the spirit of fear and anxiety to go. I command heaviness and isolation to go. I command the spirit of death to go. I call you out of the cave of defeat and into the end time army of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your presence touching people right now. Thank you for the Holy Ghost resting on people right where they are. Father, we release your healing presence right now. We release healing. We release deliverance where people are right now, where they've got heaviness. We thank you that heaviness is going now. Sleeplessness going right now. Fear going right now in Jesus' name. Father, we give you all the honor and the glory. What a joy it is to be in the end times and part of what you're doing in the earth. We love you, Father. Amen. God bless you.